Today's topic is AI and ophthalmology. Each of our two panelists will introduce themselves, give a short presentation of their current work and projects, and will share some of the insights on AI and ophthalmology with us. After that, we will dig right into the topic and talk about the opportunities and challenges of AI and ophthalmology. All of you watching us on YouTube today can send in questions via the chat you might see on the left or right hand side. And we will pick those questions up and answer them as good as we can. But to make this clear right from the beginning, we are talking to scientists in the field of AI and ophthalmology, or especially in ophthalmology. And therefore, we cannot answer or discuss any general questions you might have with regards to data security or privacy topics when you hear the name Google. So this is AI and ophthalmology and the discussion on that topic. But let's kick this event off with some introductory words from Stefanie Drese, our Minister of Social Affairs, Health and Sports in Mecklenburg-Vorpommern, from Professor Dr. Uwe Reuter, our Medical Director and Chairman of the Board here at the University of Medicine in Greifswald, from Professor Dr. Karl-Hans Endlich, our Scientific Director and Dean at the University of Medicine in Greifswald, Professor Dr. Wolfgang Motz, Medical Director and General Manager at the clinic in Karlsburg. And last but not least, Mareike Donat, Head of our Specialized Unit for Digitalization and International Affairs here in Mecklenburg-Vorpommern. Dear Sir or Madam, the Digital Health Hub Greifswald is an innovative initiative to turn the spotlight on digital concepts and applications in healthcare and medicine in Mecklenburg-Vorpommern and a promising platform for networking. This is exactly what we need to push digital innovation in healthcare. Imaging and image interpretation aren't that new in medicine. Ophthalmology, however, offers the best premise to take it to the next step. The eye is perfect for automated imaging and image analysis because you have a free view on the fundus through the pupil. Thus, the eye became the main focus of AI-based imaging. We are now even beyond just algorithms doing what we humans told them to. Google, for instance, proved that deep learning concepts can successfully be used to detect pathological changes of the fundus. You might get frightened over the fact that machines get to learn for themselves based on neutral networks and ultimately make sophisticated medical diagnosis. It is important to bring to mind that AI-based systems are just our servants. An idea IA system will benefit from both machine and human input. AI-based systems and doctors make different kinds of mistakes, so the best of both should be combined. There's no doubt that AI and machine learning will be great additions to the healthcare system. Ultimately, it will improve healthcare by producing more accurate and diagnosis much faster and making care more cost effective. Ladies and gentlemen, AI-based systems can process information faster than humans and can manage vast quantities of data. This is very helpful. For example, one criterion for moderate or intermediate stage non-proliferative diabetics, retinopathy might involve counting the number of hemorrhages or other features in the image that imply different stages of disease. If that has to be done by a human being, it will be time consuming and potentially not as accurate as if a machine does the counting. AI-based techniques may even uncover associations between disease and detectable characteristics in the eye correlations that physicians are currently unaware of because of the vast amount of data that can be analyzed. So AI may not only provide information about the patient's current disease state, but also may provide insight into his individual risk. And this is actually amazing. It's absolutely great to have such helpers. Artificial intelligence can help physicians 
make good clinical decisions. They are able to increase reliability and improve the quality and safety of the patient's outcomes. Thereby it ensures that something is not missed uh, inadvertently. For the AI systems to become part of our treatment algorithm as a teleretinal screening program, for example, we need to have a sophisticated infrastructure that can accumulate all the information mounted to the cloud and then communicate to the physician and the patient if there is an alert and the patient needs to see an ophthalmologist. However, it is essential to include all stakeholders. A bigger challenge than a two-dimensional picture of the fundus, however, is automatic optical coherence tomography called OCT. It is widely used in ophthalmologist practices. The earlier wet macular degeneration is detected, the better the therapy outcome is to be expected. At the moment, OCT testing at home is evaluated to enable autonomous checkups at home. Especially for older in a mobile patients, those eye doctors are far away. This is a great perspective. So this challenge is being taken up. What makes it so important are the great opportunities of OCT, especially when automated. OCT can measure the macula much more accurately. This is hugely important because the macula can be seen as the eye within the eye. The macula makes us read, recognize faces and all the details because the vast majority of the photoreceptors can be found there in an area of only 1.5 millimeters in a diameter. Thus, a healthy macula is essential to a high quality of life. Sophisticated methods such as OCT, companies like Google and all scientists and physicians doing the research are the key. Dear guests, I'm very happy to see the Digital Health Hub Greifswald promoting this by setting up that great meetup. The main goal is building better predictive algorithms. That would be enormous helpful for personal therapy concepts. Further prospective randomized controlled studies are needed. I guess we are on the right road and now I hope my speech was a little bit interesting. Thank you for your attention. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the conference on artificial intelligence in ophthalmology, which is conducted by Google Health and University Medicine of Greifswald. My name is Uwe Reuter and I'm the medical director and the chairman of the board of Universitätsmedizin Greifswald. Artificial intelligence is a term that is on everybody's mind these days. The technology has made significant progress in the last couple of years and is, and is used across a wide range of specialties in the medical field. Here in our school, we are using artificial intelligence already in radiology, in robotic assisted uh, surgery and in the diagnosis and therapy of many disorders. Professor Stahl is spearheading artificial intelligence in ophthalmology and his focus on retinal disease has made huge progress and has brought huge progress in the field of ophthalmology. I'm excited to hear news and progress about artificial intelligence in ophthalmology, which I'm sure will be the outcome of your conference. I'm wishing you a successful and very fruitful conference and with this I'm heading over, handing over to my colleague, the Dean of the Medical School. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Karl-Heinz Endlich. I'm the Dean and Scientific Director at University of Medicine Kreiswald. Artificial intelligence um, will have a profound impact on clinical procedures and on patient care. To this end, last year we founded the Digital Health Lab at University of Medicine Kreiswald as a platform for the exchange, for the interaction between theoretical scientists and clinicians. And the idea is to bring AI faster 
to the clinic and to the patients. Professor Stahl is one of the founding members as he is working with artificial intelligence in ophthalmology very early on and he is one of our specialists on applying artificial intelligence. I'm looking forward to the presentations of Dr. Hamel and Professor Stahl and I wish you interesting insights, fruitful discussion and inspiring scientific exchange. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, diabetes is increasing all over the world. About 10% of the population in Germany has diabetes. Retinopathy is a major complication of diabetes and a serious eye disease and can lead to blindness. One of the challenges is to recognize diabetic retinopathy early, particularly in the face of an increasing shortage of specialists. Artificial intelligence offers the possibility of broad screening here. For this reason, we have established retinopathy screening in our diabetic clinic using artificial intelligence. The fundus of the eye of the patients is photographed by a technician and all the findings are sent to a cloud and evaluated there. This project is scientifically evaluated by Professor Andreas Stahl from the University of Greifswald. Ladies and gentlemen, in my opinion, the use of artificial intelligence will significantly improve the quality in medicine, here in ophthalmology. This is of particular importance in clinics in rural areas. A major problem with the spread of artificial intelligence is data protection, particularly between the United States and Europe. Much effort still has to be made here in the field of big data business in order to eliminate worries amongst the patients and also in politics. In summary, ladies and gentlemen, artificial intelligence, also in other areas of medicine, will not replace doctors in the future. But it gives doctors more time for their patients and gives patients more security comparable to the assistance systems in today's automobiles. Thank you very much. Dear speakers and guests, my name is Marek Donat and I work with my team on digital transformation in Mecklenburg-Vorpommern in the Ministry of Interior. One big focus of my work is to establish regional digital innovation centers together with universities and selected cities. In the meantime, six centers have started their work, such as the Alte Mensa in Greifswald. This is always about meeting, discussing and generating new ideas, but also developing ideas further and trying them out. To this end, we have developed creative spaces and competence teams in which it should be fun, of course, to develop and try out ideas. We create use cases for the region new trend topics such as digital health, artificial agriculture, gaming and so on. And of course new startups together with an ecosystem consisting of science, business, politics and administration. And we rely on international contacts because companies and startups must also focus on thinking internationally in Mecklenburg-Vorpommern. We depend on events like this today and also on the commitment, like that of our ambassador of digitalization, Thoralf Schnell. The topic today, AI and ophthalmology, is quite important for the digital health sector. We met some very interesting startups in Israel in this field. The solutions they have found are so helpful for a lot of practical needs. And that is why I'm especially looking forward to our international speakers and guests today. And thank you especially for your time. And now enjoy the workshop and I give back to Torav. Thank you very much for those welcoming words and thoughts on AI and ophthalmology. I will now hand over to Professor Dr. Susanne Schnell. 
She is responsible for the new medical physics master's program here at the university in Greifswald. And her research interests include medical image processing, image processing workflows, neuroimaging and cardiovascular magnetic resonance imaging. And as you already can hear and see, uh, <laughs> if I'm, I'm not sure if I pronounce everything right, but as you can see, I think she's much more capable of uh, to moderate this meetup than I will. And yeah, great to have you, Susanne. Mike is yours. Thank you very much, Toro, for introducing me. Um, yes, I, my name is Susanne Schnell, and I'm a professor at the University of Kaiser. As Toro said, my specialty is actually MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, but I have done a little bit of work in AI. And I also worked a little bit in ophthalmology, uh, ophthalmological uh, areas, sorry for that. Um, in my very past, so um, I think I can have today's moderation a little bit uh, and maybe with questions that people have in the chat that, were, that I will relay. But I would like to introduce our first speaker. We have heard already in the welcome speeches um, a lot about him. His name is Andreas Stahl. He is a professor of ophthalmology here in, in, at the University of Medicine in Greifswald. And he will talk today about artificial intelligence in ophthalmology and is wondering if AI can help with blindness. Thank you very much. Thank you, Susanne. Um, I will share my screen with you. I've prepared a few slides. Um, I see this more as a brief, um, just collection of buzzwords maybe for the discussion that we will have after my talk and Nama's talk. My topic is, is very brief, it's AI and retina. And I've picked three different examples three different retinal diseases that affect patients across different age groups. On the very left-hand side, you see a picture from an infant with retinopathy of prematurity. So this is from an eye of an infant that is born prematurely. And at the time this image was taken, the infant should in theory still be in his or her mother's womb and not um, out on a, a NICU ward. The second picture here in the middle is from a patient, an adult patient with diabetic retinopathy. And on the right-hand side, we are at the other end of our age spectrum in a patient who has age-related macular degeneration. And for all three diseases that I picked here, I will go into um, each uh, in one um, example each to see how AI can help diagnosing and maybe even improving treatment for these conditions. So the first would be retinopathy of prematurity. These are the different stages for retinopathy of prematurity. Um, left on the top row is stage one, then stage two, stage three, and there's stage four and five at the bottom. And we don't want to see those two. We want to pick up a patient roughly when they hit stage three. And you can see there's a lot of vascular changes. And this vascular change is what we try to pick up both when we do fundoscop fundoscopic exams in these patients, but also when we use, use AI, AI, AI algorithms. So how can we recognize plus disease, this change in the vessel patterns? Initially, this was done by using a standard photograph. This was taken from the iCROP publication back in 1984. They defined a standard photograph of what PLUS disease is, this change in the vascular pattern at the posterior part of the eye. Now you can all imagine different doctors looking at a patient and then comparing what they see mentally to this standard photograph that they have in their memory or have in front of them um, on a printed paper or on a computer screen, and then start discussing whether this patient now does have or does not have enough PLUS disease to trigger a treatment. This is not what we see as an ideal situation today, because obviously um, there's a lot of subjective uh, subjectivity going into defining what a PLUS disease is and what is not. So in the last iteration of the ICROP um, definition of PLUS disease, we moved away from using a single standard photograph and defined PLUS disease, this vessel change at the posterior part of the eye, more as a spectrum from normal uh, uh, on the left-hand part of the panel 
to really severe disease on the right hand part. And if you take these images um, and tease out the really important patterns, this is just taking the vessels and looking at the tortuosity and the dilatation of these vessels. And clearly just from looking at the uh, bottom part of that screen now, you can see this is something that should be very good for a computer to analyze, maybe better than for a human brain. Um, and this is what we try to do. And uh, in order to do this, you need to have um, a multitude of images. You can't do this on a single sample photograph. You have to take images from many patients. And fortunately, we do have um, clinical images from clinical trials now from infants with ROP. We have those at baseline. This is the top row here and uh, at end of study. And maybe more importantly, we have them from in between. This is an example from a patient who goes from baseline after treatment to a very good disease stage four weeks later, but then um, experiences a reactivation of disease only six weeks after this image here was taken. We see again this vessel change here, tortuosity, dilatation of the vessels, and in the periphery changes of the ROP as well. This needs to be retreated at this stage. And it was done, it was retreated, and the disease went away. But it is very important during such trials and also in clinical reality to pick up when such an ROP reactivation occurs and treat it in time. So the question here was, can we use AI-based algorithms to detect ROP reactivation by looking at the posterior pole vessels? And in order to do so, we uh, joined forces with a team from Pete Campbell, who already has developed a very good algorithm looking at ROP images and the vascular severity in primary ROP screening mainly. And we applied his method to our um, CAROP imaging set. So an imaging set coming from a clinical trial. And very interestingly, we can use his vascular severity score to describe how after baseline, after treatment, ROP severity goes down at week one and week four, and then identify those eight eyes in our study that actually had a reactivation of the disease disease that did require retreatment. So this very nicely showed that AI-based algorithms are very good at picking up such vascular changes and showing us when there's a need for retreatment. Moving from infants to adult patients to diabetic retinopathy. In diabetic retinopathy, we're a bit further or maybe much further than we are in ROP because there are devices that are already present in our clinic. We're here in Greifswald, based very close to the Baltic Sea, and only half an hour away is another hospital in Karlsburg, where we do um, the ophthalmological screening for diabetic patients. Now, um, we try to improve our ophthalmological service there by including AI-based algorithm that's, our, that's already on the market. What we do now is we take retinal photographs in the hospital in Karlsburg without an ophthalmologist ophthalmologist being there. The AI analysis is automatically done on these images, again, without an ophthalmologist being at that hospital. The ophthalmologist comes once a week, always on a Wednesday, and then reviews all data and can review all patients. What we try to do with our AI, AI algorithm here is we try to improve the efficiency of our ophthalmological office hours. We don't necessarily have to see each individual patient, only the ones at risk. We can prioritize critical patients. We can give access to screening for patients who otherwise would have missed their ophthalmological appointments. And we can also use it as a telemedicine tool, especially in times when, for example, due to COVID, we can't go to that hospital. The challenges are, however, we try to get good images without pupil dilation. Ideally, you don't want to apply eye drops in a setting where there's no ophthalmologist uh, around. And when the images are taken, there's no ophthalmologist at that hospital. So we do it without pupil dilation. And that is um, a significant downside of the method. In around a third of patients, we don't get good quality images. So this has nothing to do with the AI, AI algorithm. This is just the mere difficulty of getting good images for the AI algorithm to work with. And this is maybe something we can discuss later on. 
if we do get images, there are some false positive results. And we saw this is particularly the case with younger patients. This is an example from, an, from a juvenile uh, fundus from a patient who is maybe 10, 14 years old. And uh, the AI, AI algorithm diagnosed this patient as having moderate diabetic retinopathy. And all ophthalmologists in the audience now will say, well, this is not diabetic retinopathy. This is just a juvenile eye. This is a normal eye of a young patient. And this is probably due to the fact that the training data set contained maybe not enough of these younger patients. So there might be some errors here when it comes to diagnosing diabetic, diabetic retinopathy in younger patients. This is just one example um, where you have to make sure you really review the data you get from these AI-based systems. So very briefly, the results this can all be uh, read now in our publication. It was um, just uh, published online this week. Uh, we compared the IDXDR diagnosis, that's the AI-based algorithm, to our physician diagnosis. So the gold standard, what does the physician say when he looks the patient into the eye? And you see there's full agreement in around 40% of cases. The fact that IDX, the AI algorithm here, underestimates the R only in very few cases is, in my view, a very good thing. Um, if it errs, it errs on the side of caution. It overestimates diabetic retinopathy compared to our uh, physician, which is obviously a good thing for a screening device. If you look at um, images where you do get sufficient quality and the AI, AI algorithm can work, the negative predictive value for severe diabetic retinopathy is a very good 99.6%. There's only one patient up here where the algorithm did not correctly say this is uh, not a, a severe retinopathy of prematurity, uh, sorry, diabetic retinopathy. This, only, this one patient is uh, the 0.4% missing to 100 here. Otherwise, the algorithm either identified severe di diabetic retinopathy correctly or overestimates the severity. Moving from diabetic retinopathy to age-related macular degeneration, my last example for today. AMD today. A patient comes into our clinic um, and says, I don't see very well anymore. We do an OCT and we find you have age-related macular degeneration. Now, this is not what our patient wants to hear. What our patient wants to know is how well will I see and if you treat me, how many injections will I need? And then we can explain to the patient, well, on average, you probably need around eight injections in the first year, and you have a very good chance that your vision stays stable or maybe even improves. But that's also not what the patient wants to know because that graph here on the left-hand side shows you there are patients who need one or two or three injections and some who need 12 injections. And there's no way for us to tell that patient whether she will be here or here. So the cohort data we use today in our everyday clinic to predict something about the future of an, of an individual patient has nothing to do with an individual prediction for that particular patient. And here's the question, can, I, can AI help us to be better? What we do now is we can diagnose AMD and we can put a label on it. And um, artificial intelligence has been shown to be quite capable of doing the exact same thing. This was an article published in 2018 showing that AI algorithm can also put a label to the disease and say, this is AMD. The interesting question is, can it do more? Can it give us a prognosis for an individual patient? This is something we looked, um, we tried to investigate in an ongoing um, um, analysis. We took OCT images from many patients. In, in this example, it's over 3 million individual images from over 3,000 patients. And then we tried to analyze whether we can predict visual acuity with AI, AI algorithms from these images. And the first question is, can we give a diagnosis? And as I said earlier, this works quite well. We, could, we can put a label to the disease if it's normal. Um, our algorithm in most cases 
also agrees with the human diagnosis that is, is normal. It can identify DMEs, or diabetic macular edema, and AMD. The more, much more challenging question, however, is can it also predict visual acuity for patients? And here you see the diagonal line again. A lot of these patients actually end up on this diagonal line, meaning the prediction corresponded well with the real visual acuity. But there are far too many numbers down here and up here. So there are many eyes where the algorithm was off track and didn't find the right estimate for visual acuity prediction. And this is a work in progress. And I put this here just to show you that it's much more difficult for AI-based algorithms to predict the future, just as it is for us humans uh, in our everyday clinic. But this is something where I personally see a big advantage of AI algorithms if they get into the clinics and help us doing something what currently we're only partly able to do. So to summarize AI and retina, we looked at three different conditions. In ROP, we asked, can AI help us to predict ROP reactivation? In diabetic retinopathy, we asked, how do we incorporate AI algorithms that are already there in our clinical routine? And in AMD, we asked, can AI assist in individual disease prediction? And maybe just uh, for a discussion later, I highlighted three words here that I find personally very important. I see AI algorithms as a tool. They can help, they can assist, and they need to be incorporated into our toolbox that currently exists already of many different tools. Fundoscopy is one tool, OCT is another tool. And in my view, um, AI-based algorithms can just as well be the next tool in our toolbox. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Stahl. It was very impressive. Um, I see already a few questions in the chat, and uh, but I would like to postpone the questions to after uh, when we have our discussion. I hope that's fine. Um, what I would like to do now is actually to introduce our next speaker, um, uh, Nama, Dr. Nama Hamel from uh, Google Health. She is an ophthalmologist and has a lot of research experience as well as clinical experience in ophthalmology. And uh, we are very excited to have her here today as a speaker. And with this, I hand over to Nama. Thank you, thank you so much. I will try to share my screen. Um, here it is. Okay, you can hear me now, right? Excellent. Okay, so thank you so much for, for having here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, my name is Nama. I am an ophthalmologist, a glaucoma specialist by training. Um, and at Google, I work on a team that applies machine learning um, to medical images and medical data in general. And today, um, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about some of the lessons and some of the challenges that we um, on the team have uh, learned, encountered and learned and identified um, throughout our work on trying to create this tool, right? So taking from the machine learning model to an actual tool, that the tool that Professor Stahl was, was talking about. Nama, oh yeah, perfect. Not working? Oh, no, it's fine now, not? thanks. Okay, okay, excellent, mm -hmm. sorry. So these are my financial disclosures. Okay, so um, machine learning is already all around us, uh, whether we are aware of it or not, um, and is already uh, powering many of the tools, consumer facing tools that many of us, if not all of us are using on a daily basis. So from searching unlabeled photos in the photo app to using text sensitive um, email reply suggestions in the email or using a translation app. But machine learning or AI, AI has also showed a huge potential in healthcare. So not only the things that um, Professor Stahl has talked about, but uh, many others, so ophthalmology, but also cancer detection, um, skin cancer, breast cancer, um, radiology, MRI, and other things. And the 
beautiful thing or the best thing about this technology is that it works not only in the hands of, of professors, um, machine learning researchers, but also in the hands of undergrads and even, even high school students can uh, uh, train machine learning models and get good results. And we have seen an explosion of publications in uh, scientific literature at the intersection of healthcare life sciences and machine learning in recent years. Um, but the translation has actually been much slower. So given that adoption of machine learning models in consumer facing products and this explosion in research in healthcare, one would expect uh, similar adoption in the healthcare space, like products that are powered by machine learning. But we have not seen that. So why, why is that? Why is this gap between expectations and reality? And we think we've identified a few, um, a few things. Um, I'll go over three that um, probably contribute or may contribute to this, to this gap. So let's start with number one. Uh, we call them myths, right? So things that we believe are true, but are actually not so true. So myth number one is more data is all you need for a better model. And diabetic retinopathy has been uh, mentioned a few times. This is also where uh, our team has started um, over five years ago. I was not part of, that, of the team back then, unfortunately. But they started with diabetic retinopathy. And what they did was they um, acquired 130,000 retinal images from uh, ret uh, diabetic retinopathy screening programs in the US and in India. They built a labeling tool and they onboarded, they recruited 54 ophthalmologists to sit down and look through these images and say whether um, they have or don't have diabetic retinopathy and what level of diabetic retinopathy. And if you can see here, there are 130 images, but there are uh, 880,000 diagnoses or labels um, connected to these uh, images. And um, I'll tell you in a minute why. And this means that each image had between three and seven labels or between three and seven ophthalmologists look at that image and say what they think. And that is somewhat because of what this slide represents. Um, and we call this the rainbow chart. And this is probably not so um, surprising to the ophthalmologists and physicians in the room, but it was definitely surprising to the engineers um, on the team. And what this represents, you can see on the on the x axis is the different ophthalmologists that looked at their, the the um, different images. On the y axis is the fundus images. So each row represents the collection of labels or collections of diagnoses given for a given image. And you can see that there's a lot of disagreement. Um, and um, again, what was surprising that it's more subjective than we think, right? And retina specialists are in a good place. They have a very clear uh, severity scale for diabetic retinopathy and for AMD, but still there's a lot of intergrader and intergrader disagreement. Um, and as from my experience sitting down and, and labeling photos in my fellowship and then later in work, um, I often disagree with myself, right? So um, I get tired, I get hungry, I have a mood. Um, and again, this is retinopathy, which is easy. Think about glaucoma. Right? We don't even have a good, uh, we don't even have a good definition for glaucoma. So all this is from the, uh, from that first paper about diabetic retinopathy, and I want to focus the attention on this figure from the paper that actually is very useful and doesn't get a lot of attention. And um, this figure represents our team's thinking. Well, how much data do we actually need, and how much data is is enough? for training a good model. And what they did was, and you can see here on panel A, it shows the performance of the model as a function of the number of uh, images in the, in the data set, right? In the training data set. And they started with a few hundreds and you can see that as they added more data or as the data set that was trained on was larger, the perform performance uh, increased, but only until a certain point, right? At some point, the performance plateaus. So more data, is better, right? We know that ML models are greedy and they need a lot of data, but more data and more data is not enough. At some point, the performance will plateau and there's something else that needs to be taken into consideration. And this brings us to panel B, which um, shows us the uh, performance of the model as a, as, a per, as a function of the number of images. So in the training data set 
for this for this model, there were on uh, on average four and a half images per four and a half labels, four and a half diagnoses per image. And what 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 the team did was they were thinking, let's see what happens if we decrease the numbers, the number of labels that we take, right? So we take less and less input, uh, less and less diagnosis per image, uh, making the ground truth a little bit more uh, noisy. And let's see what that does. And interestingly, when you decrease or when you make the data more noisy or the label labels more noisy for the training set, it didn't have much effect. But for the tuning set, which is the test, the set that you test uh, against while you uh, train the model, while you develop the model, um, it had a lot of, uh, it had a um, significant effect. So it's not just about the number of images, it's also about how the quality of your data, the quality of the labels that you are, uh, that you have that you train against. So given, um, given uh, limited resources that we all encounter, uh, it, probably makes sense to invest in the in high quality ground truth for the tuning and the, um, the test set. And that's exactly what was the follow up study that the team did. They, after publishing the first paper that was on par with ophthalmologists, they took a smaller tuning set graded deeply by retina specialists only who are the gold standard for this, right, for diabetic retinopathy um, um, diagnosis. And the model's performance actually increased and is now on par with retina specialists. Another different example of, of how the quality of labels is uh, important and affects the performance is this um, other model, other work that our team has done. And what they did here was um, diagnosing DME from fundus images is um, not great because we use, health, uh, we use hard exudates as a proxy for the presence of edema, which is basically fluid, right? So it's not, a, it's not a great proxy. And what they did here was they gave the model as input the fundus photo, but the label of yes or no uh, DME was taken from an OCT, which is a much better tool to diagnose fluid in the retina. And as you can see here, these dots represent what uh, human graders, uh, per, how human graders performed detecting DME with fundus photos only, not seeing the OCT. And this is how the model performed. Look, can you see my uh, cursor? I hope you do. Okay, perfect. Um, how the model performs when the ground truth was of much higher quality, it came from, from OCT. So the first take home message here is it's not about, it's not just about the quantity of the data, it's also about the quality of the ground truth and the quality of the labels that you use when you train your model. Myth number two, so we have a model, we trained it with high quality data, it's very accurate, we're done, right? We don't need anything else, we have a good product, we can ship it to the world. Not really, because uh, what, you, what we try to do, right? We try to put the product or we try to put the model in the clinic and help healthcare workers, we wanna tr try to help uh, facilitate screening, right? But if the model is put in a product that is not fitted well with the um, workflow of the clinic, if it's, it becomes a burden on this nurse who's running the, uh, uh, the screening process, she will not use it, right? So we need to look very deeply into what makes a product useful in the clinic. Um, and this, this means running deployment research and trying, trying out different models and basically building the workflow to use these tools around what happens in the clinic and how it fits and how, how it integrates uh, nicely. And these are examples from our um, deployment research that is done both in Thailand and India. And this, this study, we, had a, we did a prospective study trying to, uh, to figure all these things out in Thailand. It's coming out really soon, it's accepted, but it's not published yet. Um, and this is an example of, of how, how to do this or how we do it, right? So, we have a, a big team. It's not just ophthalmologists. It's not just the nurses. We have a big team of human of human computer interaction or human centered interactions uh, researchers who look deeply into the, the workflow and um, map each and every person's uh, each and every step along the way, um, trying to see how we optimize and where we place this uh, algorithm or where we place the product in order to get um, better uh, better results. 
So it's not just about having an accurate model. It's about having a usable usable model that can or usable product sorry that can actually integrate into the workflow myth number three a good product is sufficient for clinical impact so we trained a model we built a product we made sure it fits into the workflow of the clinic are we done have we solved all uh, diabetic retinopathy problems in the world no um we place it in the clinic, and if you manage to get into the clinic, you're fine. But what happens when you, and which is the case for many, many people around the world, don't even have access to the clinic, right? Some people need to work to walk three days to get to a clinic to get to such a product. Um, so, and I think uh, Professor Stahl mentioned this, right? Going to rural places and um, trying to bring the product into the into the uh, to the places where people are meeting people where they are, and this will require a lot of health economics and outcomes research, right? To make to understand how the system can incorporate such products and what are the costs not only of the screening but also of the downstream effects, right? Once we screen someone, then then what? We want to make sure they get treatment, right? We want to make sure that there are good outcomes and they're that we preserve their vision. And this, um, um, this graph is from a, a paper and from a very nice work done by um, researchers <clears throat> in Singapore, in the Singapore uh, Eye Research Institute, Dr. Uh, Professor Wong. And what they did was they, um, they compared three screening arms, one that was fully automated, um, artificial intelligence only, one that incorporated both human and artificial intelligence, and one that was human only, and they compare the cost effectiveness of all three arms. And surprisingly, or maybe surprisingly, maybe not surprisingly, but interestingly, um, the arm that we used both human, that combined both human and artificial intelligence uh, proved in this study to be the most cost effective. So there's a lot of work to be done in this space to see how we actually realize this. And this has nothing to do with the models themselves or the artificial intelligence, right? The technology itself. It has to do with how this integrates into the broader system and, and makes and makes an impact. So it's not only about right the, the, the model, it's also about how we impact the system. So in conclusion, um, label quality and ground truth are uh, critical to building accurate models. Um, Human-centered approach is required in order to make this product, to make these models into a useful product. And then um, implementation and health economics research is needed in order to bring these products into the world and make a uh, clinical impact. So thank you so much for listening. Um, and I'm looking forward to a fruitful discussion and I'll hand it over to you, Susanna. Thank you very much, Nema. This was very interesting and a very good insight into what's happening in the AI world and of commodity. Um, I haven't seen many questions so far, but please, uh, I hope there will be some postings of questions. Um, I do have a few questions. I made myself a long list. <laughs> and um, I also hope that the two of you, Professor Stahl and, and uh, Nama, would ask each other some questions. But let's, let's start. Um, I was wondering, because Nama's presentation was last, um, there's actually a lot of labor needed to, to label all the data sets. You said this, this was like uh, thousands of data sets that you would need uh, with good quality, of course. Um, and I'm wondering, are there efforts to actually pool data sets from several institutions? And uh, is, is this something that's currently done or is this something that we need to put some effort in, in doing that? Do you want to answer first? I'll answer after you. Um, no, Nama, you go first. I think this is this is more your area of expertise. You talked a, a lot about really developing these models, and I think it's 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 a question that really goes to the core of, of some of the issues we we have when we develop these models. And I think you're you're probably better equipped to answer this one. No problem. Uh, so if I understood the question correctly, um, this was about the need for a lot of data and how we overcome it, right? Um, so um, actually at Google, we're, we're in a, 
um, a lesser position or not as good a position as, as in the university, right? Because the university hospital has the data. The data belongs to the patients, but the, the researchers can access it, right? So um, we are not, uh, like we're not caregivers. We, we do not see patients. We do not. So we um, spend a lot of, of effort in, um, in acquiring data sets, right? In, in, um, so that's, that's one thing. Um, the other thing is, yes, definitely um, we need to pull data for, for various reasons. One reason is uh, to get enough of it, right? When you set off, you don't know how much data you will need for a specific problem. So we learned on the way for diabetic retinopathy that we needed 60,000 uh, images or at, at least, right? But that's something that you learn on the way and you never, and it's hard to predict uh, when you set out. The other thing is that in order to, in order for um, algorithms to be useful or to be um, uh, really helpful in the world, right? We want them to work on as many people from as many backgrounds as possible. So we would like to, to be able for the model to generalize to additional populations, uh, different ethnicities, different races, different genders, different um, ages, ev everything, right? And we want it to be um, at, a, at a, another level is we want the models to work on images from different kinds of cameras, right? And the model only knows what you show it. It will only learn what you show it. So if if we don't show it, m many examples, it will not it will not be able to identify them. If that makes sense. Um, so even if you train on on some limited amount of data, you want to test on different uh, populations and show that it generalizes, and that requires multiple data sets with all the different characteristics. And and just to maybe add on to this, I think there's there's even an an ethical dimension to that question because if you train your your model only on a pre-specified set of for example only male patients it's not ethical to do this because it won't work as well on female patients or take different age groups different ethnicities so there's almost um, a, an overarching problem of how do you make sure this really applies to everyone in the same quality. You have to make sure you don't make good quality AI medicine for some that does not work as well or, or maybe even misleading in others only because they were not represented in, in your initial training data set. And for example, our experiences with the DR algorithm, uh, that it works nicely on adult patients and not so well on younger patients. That's, that's one of these examples where probably a certain age group was underrepresented in the training, uh, in the training phase. And, and your one graph showed it nicely that you could go uh, up to almost 100% with 40,000 patients. And then it didn't matter if you had 100,000 more or not but it's probably more important um, not just adding the same patients to the training set, but to broaden your variety of patients that go into the training. Yeah, this, this makes a lot of sense. Um, we are getting some questions from, uh, in, from the audiences. For example, one that I actually had, I had a similar question uh, from Jan Berger. He's asking, is the usage of AI and ophthalmology more a proof of concept, or is it actually really um, something that is used in the clinic? Oh, it, it is there. It is it is being used in the clinic. We're using it in diabetic retinopathy, and um, I showed only one example. There are uh, several FDA-approved algorithms that are AI-based in ophthalmology, and they are being used uh, as we talk. Very nice. That's great to hear. And then there's another question from uh, Stefan H. Uh, the, he says, Shook Google Health was, I don't know, uh, was quite visible at him as him. him as as him 2018. Um, yeah. Part of this was some hype around this famous study predicting cardiovascular disease from retinal studies. Yeah, I remember that too. Had this led to products in clinical use and clinical use? Yeah, so um, 
definitely that that study was i think an eye opener to for me for sure um and i think to many other people um when i joined the team this was just uh, um uh, coming to a conclusion that study and um well i joined and i thought um I'm the I'm the expert. They bring me here to you know teach the model or teach the computer, and you know the computer will be maybe as good as me, but it will never be better than me, right? And then I saw the results of this, and I was like, okay, well, and it's not so much the cardio, it's the uh, it's the age and sex prediction in that in that paper. So I think um, that explains the hype, and rightfully so. And I, I when I think about that paper, I think about it as um, as a proof of the of the power of machine learning and the potential of machine learning, that it, it can do things that we can't, um, for sure. There's no doubt about it, right? It's computing power of the, of the algorithm is better than ours, um, but um, it definitely need, needs our, our input. Um, so that was done as part of research, we, um, and I'm part of a research team, and not all of the things that we do will become products eventually, um, that's one. And two, specifically for that problem, that is a tough problem. Even in that paper, um, it was a proof of concept and it showed um, uh, performance at about 70%. So better than, definitely a signal in the photo and better than chance, but clearly not ready to become an actual uh, product. Though there's a lot of more research happening in this space, I think, I just yesterday saw a, a, a paper um, using both ARIDS and UK Biobank predicting myocardial infarction from, fund from retinal fundus um, and MRI. So um, lots of work being done in that space. But again, the road from publishing a paper to actually having a product in the world is very, very long. It's easy to train a model and publish a paper relative to bringing something to the real world and now i think we we also we always have to remember we have to somehow make it explainable to us humans it is very difficult just from a very psychological perspective it's very difficult to trust a machine that tells you you have a x percent risk of getting a myocardial infarction next year in brackets but i don't tell you why i think that <laughs> You won't trust that machine. So I think this is the next challenge when it comes to having a machine that sees something in these images. We need to find a way how it can explain it to us in a way that we trust it. Yeah, I think I think I agree with you um, with a caveat. So yes and no. So I think um, we definitely want to have we need trust in the machine, right? And and explainability is part of uh, building that trust and. There are many explainability techniques to like you can cover part of the image and see how that right how that um, changes the model's performance. Um, not only to uncover what part of the image is contributing most to the model's performance, but also to to try to understand what exactly is the model looking at and and try to hypothesize why. Um, but I think that there are many tools that ophthalmologists use today without really understanding what they're doing. OCT is probably one of them. And I think, um, again, speaking from my point of view, glaucoma is, is definitely, OCT for glaucoma is definitely one area where, you know, if it's red, it's glaucoma, but you know, there, that's why there's red disease because not always when it's red, it's glaucoma. But if you don't understand what the machine is actually doing or what the meaning of the results uh, is, then, then it's like a black box in the same way, right? I fully agree, Nama. I think the difference is only uh, in, in our model of what glaucoma is, that black box was built by ourselves, uh, us humans, and therefore we yeah. tend to believe in our own black box, but we tend not to believe in a black box that was built by a machine that won't explain it to us. Um, but you're absolutely right. In, in many ways, in many parts of medicine, we don't really understand what we're looking at, but we pretend we do. <laughs> Very interesting discussion you both have. Um, yeah, I, I have another question. Um, uh, Andreas, you, you talked about that uh, image quality is actually hindering the machine to do a good job. Um, I'm wondering, could you not just 
build an AI to improve image quality? Is this something people work on? I don't know if somebody works on, on it, but um, the, the, I think the human factor is very strong there. Um, if you think of a patient with diabetic retinopathy, that patient does not only have diabetic retinopathy. That patient has various other conditions. He might not be able to walk well or sit well, or he might have Parkinson's disease. So for, for some patient, it's, it's even a challenge just to sit down quietly in front of a machine and look into a small pinhole that the camera needs for getting a good photograph. Um, and, and that human factor is difficult to take out of the equation simply by using an algorithm. Um, I'm sure there are ways um, to use algorithms to improve an image. But the first step is to actually even get an image in the first place. And some patients just can't sit down in front of the machine. And then it becomes very difficult to get a good image from these patients. And at the same time, these patients might be the ones who need the diagnosis the most. So it's easy to diagnose young and healthy uh, cooperative adults but you're more interested in, uh, in the sick and uh, unable to walk older patients that you might not even get to the hospital. And that's uh, part of what Nama um, alluded to in, in her talk as well. The first problem is to get um, the patient to either a doctor or to a camera. And that in itself can be a problem. That kind of brings me also to uh, a question regarding uh, Nama's talk. You said that labeling uh, is, is an issue. So part, the one issue was image quality, but then there is labeling quality. And you showed this nice rainbow diagram. And uh, I'm wondering if the doctors don't agree, how do you get the machine to agree? And, and with whom should the machine agree? <laughs> Right, so, um, well, the machine learns from what the doctors say, right? And one way that we um, on the team have um, uh, developed to, to deal with it, and, and, and to some degree, it's something that's done in all clinical trials, um, it, it's routine, is what's called um, arbitration or adjudication, right? So first of all, uh, you, you collect more, more labels, right? The more labels, then you, you can get either a majority vote or a discussion around why you thought this way, why I thought that way. So we have a, we have a process that we call adjudication where people, uh, you let three graders or three people look at the photo and grade it independently. And then uh, they can discuss the, uh, um, they can discuss the, the uh, disagreements and either, um, convince each other or not, right? Hopefully some at some point somebody convinces uh, the rest. But um, there's also arbitration, right? That you can have two, two people grade and then if they disagree, a third more senior person. Um, so there are ways around it and you can get, in that paper that I showed where we, the, the model's performance jumped from um, general ophthalmologist to retina specialist on diabetic retinopathy is exa was exactly uh, the work that where we developed that that process of adjudication. Is it also typical, typically done, because we do this in, in my field a lot, that you take additional clinical results uh, into the model, like risk factors uh, that come from other things than just imaging? Yes, 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 definitely. Um, there's, there's metadata, right? There's yeah. additional metadata. Um, obviously, there's demographics, which is well, basic and, and important, but um, but also in uh, diabetic, there's another uh, model that we developed predict, trying to predict um, the future, right? Like uh, some of the things Andreas was talking about, right? I look at a photo right now, I want to know what's going to happen in two years. Um, I don't only want to know what, what's the situation at the moment. I want to know if this patient will develop, will progress, will develop more severe disease, will develop a disease in general. Um, and there, um, it was all diabetic, diabetic patients. And definitely we looked at um, hemoglobin A1C and years with diabetes and family history and a bunch of other things. And I think this is really the reason why we are interested in these predictive models is because we are not very good at them ourselves. 
this is this is where we need support from our AI colleagues um, in not not necessarily in diagnosis a disease because that that's what we can do pretty well as clinicians. But this this step to move from diagnosis to prediction this would really be something on top of what we are already able to do. And I think the reason why people were so uh, enthusiastic about this paper that could read either cardiac risk factors or a patient's sex from a fundus image was because they said, well, I can't do that. I, as an ophthalmologist, I've seen many thousand fundus images and, and patients, and I can't do this. And now th the machine can do this. So whenever you come with your AI, AI, AI algorithm to a point where you can add something on top of what the clinician can do, that's when it becomes really interesting. And that's why we were also interested in, in these predictive models. And Nama, just, just your perspective, how close are we to good predictive models in DR, AMD? Um, is there something we can really rely on around the corner or is it something we will have to wait for a bit longer or maybe indefinitely? So <laughs> now you're trying to, to ask me to predict the future, but um, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so you, you mentioned the, the, the OCT for AMD, right? The, the model from, um, from DeepMind and Moorfield, um, yeah. definitely. And um, we also tried some uh, predicting AMD progression on the ARIDS data set, so from Fundus um, on my team, and, um, and this diabetic retinopathy prediction, right, for progression. So progression, I think progression is, is um, very interesting to everyone. I agree with you, it's super important. I think there's work coming out that is already be being done on this. Um, again, turning this into a product that will be used in the clinic, I think there's there's a little bit of time, but the proof of concept is here. So I want to be cautiously optimistic in saying this will become a reality. Um, probably will, but it still needs some more iterations on mm -hmm. exactly how and yeah. Would you expect these algorithms once they, they really hit the clinic to keep learning or just from a development point of view, is that not possible because you have to develop it to a certain point and then you need to get regulatory approval and therefore you can't really keep the model evolving any further exactly so the technology can keep learning right so you can you can develop it in a way that it with every patient that comes in through the system the the model improves right and learns more uh, i i totally agree with you uh the point is the regulatory approval right and 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 the regulatory authorities are are still also working right so they're uh, learning they're they're working through this and and learning how to how to manage all of this, but um, it will be a balance between these two, for mm -hmm. sure. Right, I don't see any more questions from the chat, but um, I'm just asking the next question because everybody always asks this. I know you guys have really good answers to this. Uh, so people are usually wondering if the ophthalmologist is getting replaced by an AI. Uh, what are your thoughts? I think that was answered at the very beginning. Uh, no, but <laughs> in I the want introductory, your, I right? Want your your opinions, not of uh, of the people who welcomed you. Yeah, I think I think we uh, that is totally correct. Uh, this is a tool. It's a very powerful tool. I think it's a, it's a step above all the tools that we have in terms of how powerful it is and the potential for for it to to really teach us things and and you know uh, um, really help uh, uh, transform how we deliver healthcare. But the human is not being taken out of the of the picture. But that's not going to happen. It's a, it's an assistive tool. Um, it may replace some of the things that we do currently, but it will not replace doctors. I fully agree. We have to see it as a tool, and I agree it's a very powerful tool, and it can help directing our human resources uh, to other areas where they're more needed and where they're better used. And if you think back in, in history, there are so many things that we don't do anymore ourselves. We usually don't wash our dishes ourselves because we have a dishwasher who washes our dishes while we do something else that is more valuable to us. 
And that's, that's the same with AI algorithms. They can take part of the workload um, and can empower us to use our time for something more sophisticated. Um, I'm guessing you also showed that the more difficult cases are the ones that the AI also has issues with. So that probably means you will have more time to actually look at these difficult cases. Yeah, that's actually a very good point that we haven't uh, talked about so much, but it, it's somewhere in the area of explainability when it comes to certainty of a AI models. In an ideal world, they don't only tell you why they think this patient has a disease, but also with what certainty the algorithm thinks that this patient has a disease. Um, and that's also part of, of an explainability in, in AI, AI algorithms. Um, ideally, then I don't have to look at the images anymore where, where the algorithm says, I'm 100% sure this, is, um, this patient has no disease, fine. But then I can define a threshold and I, this threshold can be 99% or it can be 80% where I say, uh, now I have to step in and see this image or the patient myself because I don't, I don't want to rely just on, on the uh, machine here. Yep, exactly. Andreas, um, maybe I just can ask you a question. If I come into your clinic tomorrow um, and uh, you presented uh, three examples on things you are working on, what, what do you use uh, in the clinic and what, what can people and patients expect when, I, when you come to your clinic? No, I always have in mind, for example, the chart you showed, how many injections do I need? So mm -hmm. is this, for example, used in your clinic so I don't get like 12 when I only need one? Um, so from the three examples I showed, you don't qualify for AMD and you don't qualify for ROP. <laughs> um, and I hope you don't qualify for diabetic retinopathy either. Um, but from the three examples I showed, the ones that are most advanced, um, Nama, correct me if I'm wrong, are the ones for diabetic retinopathy. Uh, Fundus-based algorithms that are in the clinic in, in everyday use um, so for diabetic patients, we use this uh, every week in, with our collaboration partners in Karlsburg. Um, the AMD part I showed and that you just mentioned, um, that is preclinical work. Um, and we can't use this for making a diagnosis. Why not? Because it's not at a stage where it's validated enough that it would be an approved algorithm that you can really say, well, this is validated enough that I can rely my clinical decision on it. Um, we, we are not there yet for the predictive AMD model. And we're also not there yet for the ROP model where we try to predict reactivation of disease. But we are there when it comes to picking up diabetic retinopathy in a screening population. Okay, so maybe that, that brings me to a follow-up question. As you mentioned, the algorithm needs to be approved for clinical usage, for example. How long does it take? What's the process there? I mean, you have this clinical thing. I saw in the audience Jan Bega uh, from, I think, uh, GE. So there might be people uh, there who are building products, machines, uh, and then there are those algorithms. How long does it take to get actually in there? Or what's the process of uh, getting this approval? Nama, maybe you can comment on this. this is the is... FDA faster than we guys is... are in Europe? I, I think no. you, need, you, need, you need people from so many different areas uh, for, for such a process. This is not a, a question to scientists or clinicians. This uh, brings many other specialities on board. But Nama, this is maybe more your area. Yes. So as a sign, I can only uh, answer this as a, at a very high level. Um, but but yes, exactly. This requ this requires um, at a high level again um, proving to the regulatory authority, um, be the the um, I think in Europe it's called the um, the EMA, or if it's, uh, it's European Medicine yeah. Agency would would approve at least medications, um, and then right. to, uh, to get the CE mark. Right. Well, yes, but that just basically says it's not harmful for a patient, right? If it's CE marked, um, it doesn't necessarily tell you that it's really predicting, for example, AMD very well. Um, the CE mark right. is, is, a, is a very low entry level. Um, for 
really being successful in clinical use, I think you need much more than just a CE mark. Well, you, yeah, true. To, to even be allowed to commercially, right, to, to uh, distribute this commercially, you have to have a regulatory approval. And that takes a while. Um, and, there, and you have to um, run a study that shows, right, the performance and, and answers a bunch of questions that the regulatory authority has. But I agree, in order for this to be successful and not sit in the clinic and, and collect dust, um, there's also a post-marketing um, surveillance, right? Which is done on, on drugs as well, right? So you wanna see how it performs in the real world because studies um, are studies, they're a, a controlled environment. Um, but that's that's after, that's not to get the, the approval that is afterwards to, uh, I guess, maintain it. Um, but, but it's true, it's, uh, it requires a big, uh, it's a big effort by people with lots, different specialties um, across the board, totally. And, and also the, the, one of the problems is um, that process takes time. And when your methodology in the clinic changes during that time, for example, uh, people start using different cameras. All of a sudden your AI algorithm might not work as well anymore because the standard camera in the clinic or the standard OCT is not the same anymore as it was five years ago when you started developing your algorithm. Um, in, in a way that it's, it's an arms race between different tools, the imaging tools, OCT, fundus cameras, they develop and AI algorithms develop at the same time but they have to interact in a way that combined, they deliver a reliable result. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, okay. that's a very nice way of putting it. That is very, very true. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I think uh, when I look at my clock, time is ticking a little bit away, flies by with such an interesting conversation and the two of you here. Um, I think we have to come to an end. So any closing thoughts, ideas, or something you would like to share? Besides, I hope that you guys might uh, get together for a joint research on some topic. <laughs> I no, think, I... Um, oh, sorry. Ladies no, first, no, no. Nama. <laughs> I, was, I was just gonna say, I think um, in order to make this a reality and really um, make impact on, on, you know, on people, on the world, on healthcare, on, you know, preventing violence. It, this needs to be a collaboration between the different bodies, right? It's not, it's not, not one company or one researcher or one country is going to, to solve this or, or come to a, a good, a high quality solution for this. So I, I really appreciate you inviting me here. Oh, thanks for coming and joining us. Andreas. I fully agree. Um, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I would maybe add it, it's not enough to have uh, a computer or AI specialist and a clinician. You need so many more experts and you especially when it comes to developing it into a product. We, we saw nicely on, on Nama's uh, slides what what you have to think of just in terms of usability, how to put it into a workflow, how do we get patients to be able to access it? How do we make sure it works with different machines in different countries? This is um, a very complex endeavor, but it's worthwhile doing it because it will in the end enable us to do something that we can't do today. And, and this is where I think, where I see the, the main promise in AI-based algorithms that help us diagnose, pre uh, preventing or predicting disease. Thank you very much. It was really great to have you all here. Great to talk to you. And Susanna, thanks a lot for being here and helping me out on the moderation part. Um, I'm pretty sure you can uh, offer some insights and some thoughts and your expertise as well in getting those images maybe a bit better to run uh, AI over it. <laughs> or maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> I think you can. Um, yeah, we can work on that. <laughs> I also would like to thank the both speakers. It was very interesting also for me to hear this and the progress. And I'm looking forward to the future and uh, to the studies you, you two would bring out together. <laughs> okay, right. thank you very much. Nama, have a great day. Thank you. Yours is thank basically you. more or less starting. Uh, yes, and exactly. And Andrea, Susanna, <laughs> thanks a lot. Have a great dinner, have a great night. See you soon. Bye.
And everyone out there, thanks for joining us. Thanks for your question. Uh, and thanks for listening to us. Bye-bye. Thank Just you. Bye. 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 Good night.